FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today's April 17th, 2017. So biggest news is what's going on in North Korea, although there's so many other things happening. But particularly North Korea, it looks like it's getting close to a flashpoint. And well, what's the right move? Where do we go from here? Ivan Elin is with us now, a senior fellow and director, Center on Peace and Liberty and the Independent Institute. Hey, Ivan, welcome back. Thanks for having me back, Kerry. Hey, so so we got a situation here in uh, North Korea. I don't know what your thoughts are about Kim Jong Un, but uh, what should we be doing here? Well, he is an erratic dictator, and if there's any ever a country or a person that you not want to have uh, nuclear weapons, it's North Korea under his leadership. So I think, uh, you know, it is a problem. I'm not sure it's the acute problem that most people think it is. Uh, this He's been ramping up the missile tests and that sort of thing. I still think he's probably at least four to ten years away from being able to hit the U.S., um, with a nuclear warhead on a missile that can get to the U.S., the continental U.S. Now, of course, that doesn't mean he can't hit Japan and South Korea already. And even without his nuclear weapons, he has a lot of he, they've been, the North Koreans have invested a lot of artillery tubes so that they can threaten Seoul, which is only 35 miles away from the border. And of course, there are millions of people that live there, which which would theoretically constrain any U.S. A response because if we uh, do something um, in it in an attempt to attack him, that's the first thing he'll do is start shelling uh, Seoul. And so we have to be a little careful. The other problem, of course, is unlike Saddam Hussein, unlike Muammar Gaddafi, unlike Milosevic, these dictators that we've taken out in the past, he has nuclear weapons already, or at least it's likely that he does. He just doesn't have the missiles to get them to the United States at this point, although he has medium-range missiles, that, which, as I mentioned, can hit uh, our bases in South Korea, Japan. So we do have to be a little bit more careful with him than other leaders that we've just nonchalantly taken out. And in fact, our, our po previous policies have uh, somewhat contributed to this uh, problem. Obviously, he's erratic and his father was erratic and his grandfather was erratic. So that's nothing new. However, U.S. took out Saddam and it took out uh, Gaddafi. And Gaddafi was even uh, had gotten rid of his nuclear weapons and his weapons of mass destruction programs and was playing ball with the U.S. And we still ousted him. Uh, Obama did that at the behest of the French, which was really a mistake because now we have chaos in Libya. But also the second mistake was it sends a message to countries like Iran and North Korea who might someday want to get nuclear weapons or already uh, are working on them, that that's the only way they can avoid getting invaded by the U.S. So, mm -hmm. you know, in a, to a country like uh, North Korea, you really don't want to uh, feed the paranoia, which is also already there. So this is a very dicey type of situation, and there's no real good answer. We've tried, presidents uh, have tried negotiating with North Korea, but they always say they're going to get rid of their nuclear weapons, and then they don't. And then, of course, uh, we inadvertently well, I shouldn't say inadvertently, but not on purpose. The United States government is, I guess, inadvertently is the only word I can think of at the moment. We've sort of reinforced his behavior because he likes attention and we give him attention. And probably the best thing to do with him is to treat him like a child who's misbehaving. Ignore him uh, if you can. And but we either slather him with food, more food aid, or we uh, send carrier battle groups as we are now. But whichever one we do, uh, we do very visible things, and that gives him more attention. That's how he gets Western attention. Yeah. So so he doesn't like being neglected and uh, ignored. So he'll go and do something just to bring that about, just to get the attention. Right, exactly. And uh, even if you think you're standing up to him, uh, as we are now with by sending this carrier battle group up there, um, you know, all this is replayed in the past. So that's why I say I'm not sure it's that acute of a crisis. 
there's always there's always danger there. I don't want to minimize that, but uh, will there be a nuclear war between the two countries? Probably not, since he can't reach us with nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think there's enough caution on both sides. He's very blustery, but he's very limited in what he does. He occasionally shells some South Korean islands. He launches missile tests. He even does nuclear tests, which they say he's preparing another one. And, but and he'll he'll even uh, provoke his ally China because China is really getting fed up with him. And I think Trump is appropriately working on China to bring him to heel, since they, China controls like uh, you know ninety percent of his trade goes across the Chinese border. Uh, China has investments there. Uh, North Korea sells coal. Uh, its major export to China, which China has cut off, and that's unusual. Uh, China has two problems uh, with putting too much pressure on him. One, they're afraid his regime will collapse and they'll get a bunch of refugees. And also, number two, if the regime collapses, they'll have they may have the same situation happened as with Berlin after the Cold War, where South Korea uh, unifies with North Korea under U.S. Mm -hmm. military tutelage. And so, um, you know, they they don't want a uh, U.S. alliance on their border. And remember in the Korean War, when the U.S. troops got too close to the Yalu River, the border between North Korea and uh, China, China went nuts and invaded and, of course, pushed back the U.S. for a time in the Korean War. So uh, that, that's a very key economic area for them just north of the North Korean border in very, you know, in China. And so uh, they're very sensitive about having U.S. listing posts or U.S. troops stationed right across that border. So those are the two reasons that China has not put as much pressure on North Korea as the, as the United States would like. Yeah, well, it looks like China's attitude, though, has changed uh, markedly. I mean, they've mass troops on the border. And like you said, they cut off the coal shipments, which is substantial uh, uh, amount of Korea, North Korea's exports to China. And they're ratcheting up the pressure this time. Yeah, I think they are finally getting the picture that he's very dangerous. And, you know, he's right on their border. So if he's not, if he turns ugly, they're right there. And uh, of course, the one thing that I think China is uh, concerned about is China is a trading nation. And unlike the Soviet Union, it does have economic ties, heavy economic ties with South Korea. It has heavy economic ties with Japan. And of course, these two countries are taking the brunt of uh, North Korea's missile tests. They've been splashed. The missiles have been splashing near South Korea near Japan, et cetera. And so I think China has a lot of these economic relationships to protect, and I think that's a good thing. So we may, you know, Trump may be able to work some sort of a deal. He's being very blatant uh, that China will get a better trade deal if they help us with North Korea. Yeah. And so like so many other issues in the in the world, the geopolitical scene, a lot of it is riding on China. Yeah. And I think China... Like I said, uh, China has a much bigger incentive to play by the rules than the Soviet Union ever had because it has all this web of economic um, you know, relationships, investment, trade around the world, and particularly in East Asia, where it wants to be a regional power. And I'm not so sure that the United States shouldn't allow China to be more of a regional power and perhaps, you know, retract our defense perimeter and let them do that like the British did the U.S. in the 1800s. Um, we have a wide ocean separating us from China, as the British did from the Americans. And I think that makes you more secure. Uh, distance still does matter. And moats, big moats, ocean moats do matter and for security. So um, I think China can play a, a useful role if they choose to do so. And if, the, if Trump makes them a good deal, uh, you know, Trump is a transactional president, but maybe that's not such a bad deal because I think the Chinese are very transactional, too. Mm -hmm. You know, they may feel that they can work with Trump. Yeah. Well, his uh, recent uh, meeting with uh, China's president, uh, Xi, in Florida here, appears to have laid the groundwork for what's taking place now. Yes, uh, 
Trump sort of changed his tune a bit on the currency manipulation. Of course, China has has sort of reversed that in the last couple of years. So he, Trump is not really giving anything up there by doing that, by not declaring them a currency manipulator. And he, he's, he was also saying, I think uh, President Xi uh, is willing to help us with North Korea. So I think there's a confluence of factors that are are happening. Uh, Trump is moderating his position on China, but also I think China, uh, as we were saying earlier, is getting a little fed up with uh, North Korea. Yeah. Well, do they really want uh, unbridled uh, nuclear power right on their border? Uh, even no, if it I think is? they think he's very erratic because you know he's done this latest missile test. He he just flaunts his uh, you know um, unpredictability as a as a uh, pushback even against his ally China and I think China is saying hey you know we've supported you this whole time you're we're your only friend in the world everybody thinks you're cuckoo except us so why are you doing this to us yeah yeah well you would think but you know that's is the guy Kim Jong Un is he really nuts erratic or is this part of a strategy well, I think you could say he's crazy like a fox. I mean, he's very well informed. He's the only person in North Korea that probably is. He watches yeah. all the news yeah. channels from the West. And I think he this is the way he gets attention. This is the way he keeps his country together. Remember, his country, he's still got a communist system there. And it's a communist system based on hereditary, a hereditary succession, which you really haven't seen in many other communist countries. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the Castros in Cuba are the only one, other one, but normally communist countries don't do that. But he's, his people are starving. His economy is just bankrupt. It doesn't work. And so he's got to have something to hold the country together. And I think the quest for nuclear weapons and the quest to get saying, I'm a, I'm a player on the world stage because, look, I can shoot off a missile and get the attention of all, the whole entire world, including China, the U.S., all the great powers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, perhaps at one point in his relationship with China, he was useful, a useful pawn. But perhaps now he's outlived his usefulness. And if China wants to get rid of him, how hard is it for China to get rid of him? Well, of course, they could invade the country. And uh, they did it. It would be a lot better than if we did it. But then, of course, that raises that would raise the U.S. military concern that China would just keep going. But uh, there was some arrangement between the United States, uh, led by Trump, and China, led by Xi, that the Chinese would take care of the problem for us. Uh, that might be the best, I suppose. But uh, you know, you're invading a country with nuclear weapons. And they don't know, probably know where all the facilities are. Many of them are buried. After the 1981 incident where Israel attacked the um, Osiric reactor in Iraq, after that, all these nuclear aspirants have been burying their facil nuclear facilities, like Iran buried a lot of their facilities, and North Korea has done the same. So, you know, these weapons... Uh, there's, they probably know where some of them are, but it's questionable whether they know all, where all of them are. And of course, our intelligence is probably better than the Chinese intelligence, um, because I'm sure Kim hasn't told them where they are. So mm -hmm. if they did invade or something like that, they'd have to make sure they got, they collected all the weapons. Yeah. So do you think that Kim Jong Un got any kind of message from the U.S.'s recent? actions in Syria uh, with the missile attack and in Afghanistan with the use of that uh, Moab, uh, mother of all bombs? Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, the the uh, missile attack on Syria looked pretty uh, lame. It, was, it reminded a lot of people of Bill Clinton's shooting off a few cruise missiles after Osama bin Laden had attacked the Ken, uh, embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998. So, I mean, it didn't even prevent the runway from being used uh, mm -hmm. almost right away. So I think, you know, it may, uh, Kim may take note of these things, but I think that, um, uh, and they probably were meant as a signal to him because this Moab bomb that they did in uh, Afghanistan is a 22,000 pound bomb, which is designed to take out hardened tunnels and caves uh, in mountains where people where they're hiding weapons and people in, uh, uh, 
ISIS was. And so, uh, you know, he can't help but take notice of both of them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he puts himself in those categories. I mean, he's already got nuclear weapons, and he knows that's a big uh, deterrent from the U.S. attacking him. Uh, It doesn't prevent it totally, but he's not in the category of Syria or uh, the ISIS in Afghanistan. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's got a country, and— Well, he's got nuclear weapons, and that's that's a big—I'm going to tell you right now— Having spent 15 years, uh, you know, going out to the Pentagon and uh, that sort of thing, that they do take notice when a country has nuclear weapons, uh, rather than if they don't. And uh, uh, the, our, the history of the U.S. interventions around the world show that we we don't usually intervene when countries have nuclear weapons. Now, maybe this will be. Maybe he's so erratic that. They'll have to do something, but it's very risky. And like I said, a military attack, you don't know if you've gotten all the weapons or not. You probably have to have somebody, either the United States and South Korea, on the one hand, coming from the south or China coming from the north, would have to actually invade the country and grab the weapons uh, before you could fire them off. Yeah. And I, I just wonder, you know, it's a militaristic state, kind of like no other in the world, North Korea. I just wonder, is the country so fed up that at the first sign of weakness uh, by Kim Jong-un, they'll be uh, they'll turn on him? And if there's an attack, will they uh, will they greet their invaders as liberators? Well, I mean, you know, we, we've been predicting that this regime would fall for a long time and it really hasn't. So it's stronger than I think people think it is. Now, would, would these people really fight to the death for this guy? I don't know. They could just say, OK, you know, come on in and, you know, we're just laying down our arms. We're not going to die for this guy. And that's a possibility with any regime that's as nutty as this one is and and is oppressive to its people and not providing uh, for them or I should say letting the market provide for them. Uh, but because it's, you know, he's got a total uh, totalitarian mentality uh, and he hasn't done any economic reforms at all. So, you know, the people, you don't know if the people would be loyal to him or not, but certainly the main problem, I think, his military is big, but it's really old. I think they would be, it would be defeated whether they fought or they didn't fight. They would probably be defeated pretty quickly. The question is, he, de- he does have short range missiles that he could launch uh, tactical nuclear weapons against the forces coming in to, to uh, um, you know, attack, to, to invade. And I'm sure those troops, he's put very loyal troops in charge of those weapons if he, if he, can, if he has the capability to do that. And he does have short-range missiles, and he does have problem, most probably has the nuclear weapons. So that's, that could be a problem. Uh, and he may, he might even use them against China if he thinks his regime is in danger of going down then he has very little incentive to withhold those weapons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so it's a bad situation no matter how you cut it. And as far as actions that can be taken, it's kind of an all-or-nothing proposition, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very dicey situation. And we we can't forget that, it, I don't like I say, I think it, when you, if you tune in the media, the mainstream media on TV or whatever, this seems like an acute crisis, but we've had so many of these, you know, if you follow it over time, which most people don't, they just, you know, see it when it comes on TV and then go on to some other thing. But if, if you follow these North Korean crises, they, there have been quite a few of them, and this seems abnormal. But I think we probably have, you know, four to 10 years uh, before he gets a missile that can hit the U.S. And even then, you know, Nuclear deterrence has worked for us mostly during the Cold War. Uh, well, in fact, it was it has never failed us during the Cold War, uh, even during the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Able Archer uh, incident during the Reagan administration. It's still it's still uh, held, and that's because we have the best nuclear arsenal in the world. Even if he gets a few bombs and the missiles to put put you know, get them to the United States. Of course, we have thousands of warheads and lots of missiles, and many of them are invulnerable from submarines. So, of course, you know, we can wipe this country off the map because it's a fairly small country very easily. The United States, number one, is is a big country, 
Also, he only has a few weapons. Now, of course, we don't want to take a nuclear weapon on any city. That would be a catastrophe beyond belief. Yeah. But dictators think in terms of, well, wow, I, they could incinerate my whole country very easily because they're, we have nuclear dominance compared to him. So our deterrence, I think, does, does get, provide us with something, even in the worst case where he gets you know, some weapons that he can hit the U.S. with. Yeah, I guess it comes down to the question of, do you act now before he's got all those pieces in place and take your chances? Or do you, uh, you know, do you wait hoping that uh, somehow this regime is going to fall? And Well, previously, previously, I think that both Republican and Demo- Democratic administrations, I think they felt that they could negotiate away the nuclear program as they did with Iran and get a, at least a suspension for 10 to 15 years. But I think most experts now think that that's not going to happen. He's never going to give up the weapons. And I thought that a long time ago, simply because he's paranoid. He thinks the United States is going to invade him or attack him. And uh, so, the, as you point out, the the real uh, choice is between attacking now or waiting. But the problem with attacking now is that you don't really know whether you're getting all the missiles or all the um, nuclear weapons. And of course, then he'll become very belligerent if you don't do that. About the only thing you can really do is have a total invasion of the country by either the United States and South Korea or China, I think, to get all these missiles. You know, you'd have to go after you take over the country and occupy it, you have to hunt around like we did uh, for weapons of mass destruction after Saddam Hussein. Now, Saddam Hussein had gotten rid of uh, his and had never gone back to the programs. But uh, I think you probably would find some in North Korea, both missiles, long-range missiles, medium-range missiles, short-range missiles, and also nuclear weapons. But, of course, you have to invade the country without him... um, you know, using the new, the tactical nuclear weapons, the short range nuclear right. weapons against you in some way, even if he doesn't have the missiles, he can blow off the device in some way and, and uh, on the troops coming in. So that's a problem. If you attack from the air, a lot of it's hardened, a lot of it's underground, and you can get some of it with uh, the Moab and other bunker buster bombs, but you have to find it all. And that's the key problem. I think the intelligence uh, to find all the missiles and nuclear weapons. So if you're just doing an air attack, I'm not sure that's going to work. Interesting. Well, limited options, but perhaps the time has come where some action is required and how it will be contained. I guess these are all things we need to watch out for here because, uh, you know, while it, the situation uh, is serious, it could get more serious very quickly mistake here, mistake there, kind of like what we had during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, and I think uh, if he does another nuclear test, that will ratchet it up even more than just a a failed missile test, which happened, you know, recently. Um, And so I think also Trump's rhetoric is a bit, he he better watch his rhetoric because he's going to get trapped. He's already said, well, if China doesn't do something about it, we're going to, meaning we're going to take military action. That's the implication, although Trump didn't say it. And therefore, when you let your rhetoric get get um, out in front of you, you kind of paint yourself into a corner. I think in these situations, it's better to be like Teddy Roosevelt and say, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. The U.S. does have some big sticks it can use. Well, the question is whether it wants to do that or not. Yeah, well, I have a feeling it's coming to a head. So I think we'll know more soon. Uh, You know, it's just uh, one of those situations. There's no good way of dealing with it. Yes, it's very complicated. And hopefully, I mean, Trump has some good people, Secretary of Defense Mattis and this McMaster guy is an excellent uh, national security advisor. So if he takes their advice, I think that uh, they'll proceed with more caution than Trump's rhetoric indicates. And Talking about Trump and his uh, his erraticness, if you will, what about uh, Trump? He does appear to listen to his experts, though, his his staff around him, you know, when push comes to shove. Yeah, I think he does. Uh, the problem that he has is getting out front with his rhetoric um, and then, you know, having to change positions, you know, uh, flip flop on the issue or, or modify his position. 
And I guess if he doesn't really care, if he, people sort of discount that into what he does, so maybe it won't have as big an, of an effect as a as any other politician. But because people just take it, you know, with the, you know, build it into the equation in the beginning. Um, it's it's good to be tactically, you know, sort of uh, erratic because it fool it can fool your enemy. But when you're strategically erratic or erratic at the grand strategy level, that starts uh, making your allies nervous and your enemies don't know what to, you know, don't know where your red lines are and therefore you can run into some problems. So we'll see yes. if, uh, you know, I mean, if Trump can harness his erratic nature in, into tactical situations, then, you know, he might be OK. But uh, I think hopefully in the end, he'll listen to his advisors as to what they think they think ought to be done. Yeah, which so far he appears to be listening to him for better or for worse. Well, I guess that's it for now. Ivan, uh, hey, where's the best place to find your recent writings? Uh, well, you can find them on uh, in major publications like CNN.com and uh, The Hill uh, newspaper. Also, my home website is www.independent.org. That's the Independent Institute in California. And I also uh, blog occasionally on the Huffington Post. All right. Hey, and as always, we'll have a link to uh, to your site and the show notes to this interview on Financial Survival Network. Got any questions or comments on this interview? Any others we do? Send me an email at kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com. Our Twitter feed is at Kerry Lutz, and our Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Ivan, it's an interesting world out there, and we're just going to have to see how this thing plays out. Yep, we are. It'll be very interesting to see what happens. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Shelling uh, soul. And so we have to be a little careful. The other problem, of course, is unlike Saddam Hussein, unlike Muammar Gaddafi, unlike Milosevic, these dictators that we've taken out in the past, he has nuclear weapons already, or at least it's likely that he does. He just doesn't have the missiles to get them to the United States at this point, although he has medium range missiles, that, which, as I mentioned, can hit our bases in South Korea, Japan. So we do have to be a little bit more careful with him than other leaders that we've just nonchalantly taken out. And in fact, our, our po previous policies have uh, somewhat contributed to this uh, problem. Obviously, he's erratic and his father was erratic and his grandfather was erratic. So that's nothing new. However, U.S. took out Saddam and it took out uh, Gaddafi. And Gaddafi was even uh, had gotten rid of his nuclear weapons and his weapons of mass destruction programs, and was playing ball with the U.S. And we still ousted him. Uh, Obama did that at the behest of the French, which was really a mistake because now we have chaos in Libya. But also the second mistake was it sends a message to countries like Iran and North Korea who might someday want to get nuclear weapons or already uh, are working on them, that that's the only way they can avoid getting invaded by the U.S. So, mm -hmm. you know, in a, to a country like uh, North Korea, you really don't want to uh, feed the paranoia, which is also already there. So this is a very dicey type of situation, and there's no real good answer. We've tried, presidents uh, have tried negotiating with North Korea, but they always say they're going to get rid of their nuclear weapons, and then they don't. And then, of course, uh, we inadvertently, well, I shouldn't say inadvertently, but not on purpose, the United States government is, I guess, inadvertently is the only word I can think of at the moment. We've sort of reinforced his behavior because he likes attention and we give him attention. And probably the best in Berlin after the Cold War, where South Korea uh, unifies with North Korea under U.S. Mm -hmm. military tutelage. And so, um, you know, they, they don't want a uh, U.S. alliance on their border. And remember in the Korean War, when the U.S. troops got too close to the Yalu River, the border between North Korea and uh, China. China went nuts and invaded 
and of course pushed back the U.S. for a time in the Korean War. So uh, that, that's a very key economic area for them, just north of the North Korean border, in very you know in China. And so uh, they're very sensitive about having U.S. listing posts or U.S. troops stationed right across that border. So those are the two reasons that China has not put as much pressure on North Korea as the, as the United States would like. Yeah, well, it looks like China's attitude, though, has changed uh, markedly. I mean, they've massed troops on the border, and like you said, they cut off the coal shipments, which is substantial uh, uh, amount of Korea, North Korea's exports to China, and they're ratcheting up the pressure this time. Yeah, I think they are finally getting the picture that he's very dangerous. And, you know, he's right on their border. So if he's not, if he turns ugly, they're right there. And, of course, the one thing that I think China is uh, concerned about is China is a trading nation. And unlike the Soviet Union, it does have economic ties, heavy economic ties with South Korea. It has heavy economic ties with Japan. And, of course, these two countries are taking the brunt of uh, North Korea's missile test. They've been splashed. The missiles have been splashing near South Korea, near Japan, et cetera. And so I think China has a lot of these economic relationships to protect. And I think that's a good thing. So we may, you know. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today's April 17th, 2017. So biggest news is what's going on in North Korea, although there's so many other things happening. But particularly North Korea, it looks like it's getting close to a flashpoint. And well, what's the right move? Where do we go from here? Ivan Elin is with us now, Senior Fellow and Director, Center on Peace and Liberty and the Independent Institute. Hey, Ivan, welcome back. Thanks for having me back, Kerry. Hey, so so we got a situation here in uh, North Korea. I don't know what your thoughts are about Kim Jong-un, but uh, what should we be doing here? Well, he is an erratic dictator, and if there's any ever a country or a person that you not want to have uh, nuclear weapons, it's North Korea under his leadership. So I think, uh, you know, it is a problem. I'm not sure it's the acute problem that most people think it is. Uh, this He's been ramping up the missile tests and that sort of thing. I still think he's probably at least four to ten years away from being able to hit the U.S., um, with a nuclear warhead on a missile that can get to the U.S., the continental U.S. Now, of course, that doesn't mean he can't hit Japan and South Korea already. And even without his nuclear weapons, he has a lot of, he, they've been, the North Koreans have invested a lot of artillery tubes so that they can threaten Seoul, which is only 35 miles away from the border. And of course, there are millions of people that live there, which, which would theoretically constrain any U.S. Uh, response because if we uh, do something um, in it in an attempt to attack him, that's the first thing he'll do is start. Trump may be able to work some sort of a deal. He's being very blatant uh, that China will get a better trade deal if they help us with North Korea. Yeah, and so like so many other issues in the in the world, the geopolitical scene, a lot of it is riding on China. Yeah, and I think China, like I said, uh, China has a much bigger incentive to play by the rules than the Soviet Union ever had because it has all this web of economic, um, you know, relationships, investment, trade around the world, and particularly in East Asia, where it wants to be a regional power. And I'm not so sure that the United States shouldn't allow China to be more of a regional power and perhaps, you know, retract our defense perimeter and let them do that like the British did the U.S. in the 1800s. Um, we have a wide ocean separating us from China, as the British did from the Americans. And I think that makes you more secure. Uh, distance still does matter. And moats, big moats, ocean moats do matter and for security. So um, I think China can play a, a useful role if they choose to do so. And if, the, if Trump makes them a good deal, 
Uh, you know, Trump is a transactional president, but maybe that's not such a bad deal because I think the Chinese are very transactional too. Mm -hmm. You know, they may feel that they can work with Trump. Yeah. Well, his uh, recent uh, meeting with uh, China's president, uh, Xi, in Florida here appears to have laid the groundwork for what's taking place now. Yes. Uh, Trump sort of changed his tune a bit on the currency manipulation. Of course, China has has sort of reversed that in the last couple of years. So he, Trump is not really giving anything up there by doing that, by not declaring them a currency manipulator. And he, he's, he was also saying, I think, uh, President Xi uh, is willing to help us with North Korea. So I think there's a confluence of best thing to do with him is to treat him like a child who's misbehaving, ignore him uh, if you can. And but we either slather him with food, more food aid, or we uh, send carrier battle groups as we are now. But whichever one we do, uh, we do very visible things, and that gives him more attention. That's how he gets Western attention. Yeah, so so he doesn't like being neglected and uh, ignored, so he'll go and do something just to bring that about, just to get the attention. Right, exactly. And uh, even if you think you're standing up to him, uh, as we are now with by sending this carrier battle group up there, um, you know, all this is replayed in the past. So that's why I say I'm not sure it's that acute of a crisis. There's always there's always danger there. I don't want to minimize that, but. Uh, will there be a nuclear war between the two countries? Probably not, since he can't reach us with nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think there is enough caution on both sides. He's very blustery, but he's very limited in what he does. He occasionally shells some South Korean islands. He launches missile tests. He even does nuclear tests, which they say he's preparing another one. And, but and he'll he'll even uh, provoke his ally China because China is really getting fed up with him. And I think Trump is appropriately working on China to bring him to heel, since they, China controls like uh, you know ninety percent of his trade goes across the Chinese border. Uh, China has investments there. Uh, North Korea sells coal. Uh, its major export to China, which China has cut off, and that's unusual. Uh, China has two problems uh, with putting too much pressure on him. One, they're afraid his regime will collapse and they'll get a bunch of refugees. And also, number two, if the regime collapses, they'll have they may have the same situation happened as 